So here we go. Um, let's look at example 28. This is another example for continuous function. So let fx equal to ax plus 3b, where x less than less than or equal to zero, and fx equal to x squared plus 2a minus 3b, where x is between zero and one, and x minus three, where x greater than one. This is a piecewise function. So the question said that, can you find the values of a and b that make f continuous on its domain? So of course, Since f is continuous on its domain, so that means f is continuous at x equal to zero and x equal to one as well, right? Because it it is continuous on its domain, so that means that include x equal to zero and x equal to one. So that is f zero equal to uh, limit of f x where x go to zero, right? Because this is uh, the condition that must be whole if f is continuous at x equal to zero. And also you know that f one, this is, equal to limit of fx where x go to 1, right? Because this is the condition for the continuity at x equal to 1. And then after that, well, we can compute it now. So f0, this is going to be uh, a times 0 plus 3b, which is equal to 3b. And then the second thing is f1. This is going to be uh, 1 square what else plus 2a minus 3b so this is 1 plus 2a minus 3b right and then once you look at the first equation that you have here that i box so f0 is 3b right and limit of fx when x go to 0 so well if you consider the left hand limit this is the same thing with 3b, right? Because you're gonna use the same function. So you can compute limit x go to zero from the right of fx. So we use different function here. So this is actually limit of fx where x go to zero on the left too, right? Because in order uh, to have the existence of limit when x go to zero, so the left hand limit and right hand limit must exist and they are both equal to each other, right? So 3b and then limit on the left hand. This is going to be 3b as well because we use the same function as uh, when we evaluate f as zero. So on the right hand side here, so I can plug in number zero into the second function here that I just circle. So that's mean I have zero square plus to a minus 3b. And with this equation, so I can solve. So I will have 3b equal to a. Right, so okay, let's go slow. So I have uh, 2a minus 3b equal to 3b, which means I have uh, 6b equal to 2a. That's mean a equal to 3b. All right, so I have this. And then I hope that another condition gonna leave me something that I can solve for A and B. So F1 is one minus two A minus three B. Again, if you compute limit where X go to one from the, from the left, so you're gonna use the same function as you evaluate here. So that means it is not going to help. So I'm gonna look at limit when x go to one from the right. And that is going to be uh, one minus three, which is negative two. 
right? And then after that, I simplify this thing. So I have, uh, let's go slow. So one minus two. So A here, I'm gonna replace it by three B, right? Because I have uh, the one that I highlight here, A equal to three B. So I'm gonna replace A by three B. And then after that, I have uh, here, I'm going to get negative 6B minus, one second, I think this is plus, sorry, this is plus. So plus 6B minus 3B, and then uh, negative two, negative one, so negative three. And then, well, this is 3B equal to negative three, so that means B equal to negative one, and at the end, you're gonna have A equal to negative three because A is three times of B. All right, this is your answer. That's it. So this is the question that asks you for the constant and you can solve for A and B once you use the property of continuous function. Does it make sense? Well, this is kind of similar uh, of what you did on homework one, right? But this is the question that you only have one solution. I think on homework one, you have infinitely many solutions, right? Because I think uh, for question two in, in homework one, uh, Ajahn Pantipa asks you to find A, B, and C that make the function continuous at X equal to negative two or something like that. And well, you should have infinitely many solutions, right? Because well, at the end, you're gonna solve for A, B, C, and there are more than one solution. All right, so let's wrap up chapter one here. So example 29, we already did it last time. So let's look at the summary of this chapter and this is what you should focus. So I look at the chat now and some of you said that the whole work is a little bit hard. So I would say that is the same level that you're gonna see on the exam. Maybe on the exam, you're gonna have simple question too, but for the medium question and hard question, we use the same level as homework. So that is what you expect to see. So when you do a review for this thing, so keep in mind that chapter one, this is about 20% of your midterm. And this is what you should know. So first, you need to know how to find limit from the graph. So this is very simple and vice versa. So, I mean, if I give you a graph, so you should be able to find limit. And if I give you a condition, I give that, hey, limit of F is equal to three when x goes to one, you should plot the graph as well as you did in homework one. So that is the first thing you should be able to do it. So the second thing is you should be able to find limits. Uh, in the following form. So the first one is zero over zero or infinity over infinity. This thing, the technique that you can use now is factoring or conjugate. Keep in mind that you should be able to do it. So we have example here uh, on the previous slide. Uh, one caution is you cannot use the L'Hopital rule. because we have not covered it. And if you use it, no credit. And then number two, so you should be able to do limits involving uh, absolute value. The technique, when you see absolute value, you should be able to do uh, one-sided limit, right? Because every time when you see absolute value, we, we ask you to, compute the left hand limit and right hand limit and check if they are equal to each other. That is one concept that you should be able to do it. Or the third one is squeeze theorem. 
So this one is, you usually use it when you see sine of some function. So you bow it between negative one and one or cosine some function. You bow it between negative one and one and then you can go from there and then apply the squeeze theorem or uh, sandwich theorem. And then we can ask you on limit to infinity, right? Limit to infinity. So this thing is going to be limit of fx, where x go to plus or minus infinity. Well, at least you should be able to solve when fx is rational function like px over qx. This is what we usually ask. So usually we're gonna ask you to compute limit of rational function. So you should be able to do it. Uh, and then number five, also you should be able to uh, find infinite limits. So sometimes you're gonna face the case that limit of fx where x go to some number and then you get the answer to be plus infinity or minus infinity. Keep in mind that you have to show two things. So first limit of the reciprocal equal to zero. And then the second one, you should be able to show that fx is less than or equal to, I mean, less than or greater than zero depends. The psi here gonna lead you to the answer. And uh, another objective is you should be able to check the continuity, right? At x equal to a at the point and on the interval, All right? So when you check continuity, you do three things, right? So f a axis and limit axis and also f a equal to limit. And that's how you check the continuous property at x equal to a. All right, so that is chapter one that we just learned in the first two weeks. And this is supposed to be the easiest chapter for the midterm and you know, 20%. Usually student get like 16 and up. I mean, usually student did pretty good on, I mean, this is from last semester, last year. Student did pretty good on chapter one because you have more time to digest and you know, to absorb the content. So make sure you study on it when it's go when it's come to midterm. All right, so we're gonna move to chapter two now. So please download the handout on Blackboard and then now we're gonna go to chapter two. All right, uh, let's look at chapter two, all right. So for chapter two, I'm, going to split my lecture note into two parts. So let's look at the plan for this chapter. So part one that we're gonna learn for this note is going to be the definition of derivatives, the chain rule, higher order derivative and implicit function. This is for part one that we're gonna learn here. And then uh, the next lecture note gonna be derivative of trigonometric function inverse trigonometric function and differentials. So I would say that derivative is one of the most beautiful concepts in mathematics because we have so many applications involving differentiation. So you're gonna learn the real application in chapter five, that's after midterm. So for this chapter, we're gonna just build up some tools so you can apply into the real application when it's get to after midterm. Does it make sense? So I know that in high school, some of you have learned some application like optimization. You know, I mean, some of you know how to differentiate and some of you know that, well, when we wanna find maximum and minimum for some problems, you can apply derivative or something like that. Yes, that is one application, but you're gonna see much more for this class because we're gonna use the derivative to figure out the graph of the function. Well, I mean, at least you are engineer and then, you know, you will be engineer and engineer. So that's mean, well, you cannot, 
walk away from calculus. So you will see that at some point you have to do derivative again and again and again. All right, so let's start by looking at the definition of derivatives. All right, so, well, let's look at the picture first. So this section definition of derivatives. So I have the graph of F as you see in the picture here. This is my F that I highlight in light blue. And then when we talk about derivative first, I am going to give you the idea by looking at the slope. So let's say that I have a point P here, which is, I mean, the coordinate of the point P is X equal to A and Y equal to F A, right? This is the coordinate of the point P. And then I have the point Q, which is here. The coordinate of the point Q is A plus H and F A plus H, right? We got the point P and Q, they are both uh, on the graph. And well, I can find the slope between the point P and Q, right? And if I find the slope between the point P and Q, so my slope is going to be um, slope, well, this is going to be F A plus H, which is the Y where you at the point Q and then minus the y where you add the pi p and then over uh, a plus h minus a which is h right this is my slope well the key concept is well this is the slope for the the line pq but as long as you keep moving your h go to zeros that means your pi q is going to move closer and closer to the pi p. And eventually, the pattern will be described by the tangent line of the, line, uh, of the curve y equal to fx. So let's try to look at the picture. And we are trying to uh, look at the line pq here. And then I keep just uh, move a plus h, just get close to a. And then my line is going to be more, you know, I have more slope and then that means it just keep going, keep going and at the end, well, I will have the line that represent the tangent line, right? At the point P. Well, and this is called derivative. I mean, the slope of the tangent line, this is called the derivative. So we're gonna define, this is definition. So we define the derivative of a function f at the point x equal to a by limit where h go to zero of f a plus h minus f a over h. Well, if limit exists, well, we're gonna call this thing derivative. And the notation that we're gonna use, we're gonna use f prime a. Or sometimes you're gonna see dy by dx uh, at x equal to a. Well, the same thing. So I'm pretty sure that, well, uh, a lot of you have seen this before, the notation. So again, we're gonna use f prime. This is read by f prime, right? And then that is dy by dx at x equal to a. But for this class, we're gonna first look at the definition of derivative and we will go from there. So let's start by compute the derivative by using the definition. So example 30. So we're gonna compute the derivative of this function f by using the definition. If you know the formula already, well, you can cheat and you can say, hey, I know that my answer is going to be 3x squared minus 1. This is if you use formula. I mean, some of you learned something from high school and you know how to use the formula for the function f here. So that's mean you know immediately that the answer must be 3x squared minus 1. But the question asks you to solve by using the definition. So you have to show me by using the definition. Well, if you use a formula, no credit, right? So 
by the derivative of f, which is this notation. And then I'm going to use the limit, the, uh, I mean the definition. So this is that. So I like the definition first. And then after that, you can see that I can plug in this thing to be x plus h cubed minus x plus h. Well, this is, I substitute f x plus h. And then after that, minus x cubed minus x. And then over h. All right, and then you have to expand it. So this is going to be x cubed minus uh, 3x square h plus 3x h square plus h cubed. So if you don't know how to do the cubic expansion, I don't know how to help. <laughs> you just need to practice and then you know be able to do the cubic expansion and then this is minus x cubed and then plus x. Well, the reason why I do this because I want to expand everything so I can cancel something. So I'm going to cancel x cubed and I'm going to cancel x. And then, well, if you go a little bit faster, you're going to see that you can cancel h too, but I'm going to leave it there. So so this is not too fast all right and then you can see that once you copy from the previous line so you can cancel h one more time right and then i have limit of uh, 3x square plus 3x h uh, plus h square minus 1 well, and then once you uh, use the limit laws, or the same thing with plugging in zero, right? Because the function here is continuous. So you can plug in h equal to zero, and then chalk, 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 and then at the end you get 3x squared minus one. And this is our derivative of f, right? Simple like that, but you can see that using the definition is not the easiest way to compute derivative because that means you come back to limit. As I told you on the first week, that limit is a building block of calculus. So everything is based on limit. That means you have to get better in limit first before you move on to another you know, topic. Well, derivative is actually a limit, but we are not going to compute limit all the time because it's time consuming. So we're going to build up some formula so you can compute limit easily. But well, we have to teach you how to define the derivative too because when you face the situation that the formula does not work, you have to come back and use definition. All right, so let's look at another form of definition. So this is one, this is one form of definition that I highlight in green. But we have another form of the definition that you can use it and it's going to be handy in most cases. So, well, if I, well, let's recall from the previous slide that I have f prime a equal to limit of f a plus h minus f a over h where x, h go to zero. This is the definition of derivatives at the point A. So if I use a substitution, so I'm going to let x to be A plus h. So I'm going to let something inside parenthesis to be x. And that means uh, I leave A alone. And then so my h going to be x minus A, right? Because I do a substitution. So that means x minus A. And when h go to zero, that means when x go to a. Well, this is another form of derivative, right? The definition of derivatives. Another form of the definition of derivative is this, right? So when you do the problem, you can either use the form that I write in purple or the form that I write in black. 
Well, it doesn't matter what you use, but the answer must be the same. Does it make sense? That is uh, another form of the definition. So as we talk from the last chapter, when we talk about limit, we're going to have left hand limit and right hand limit. So the same thing when you talk about derivative and derivative is a limit. So you're going to have left hand derivative and right hand derivative. So if your definition, I mean, if you look at your definition and you just consider only when h go to zero from the left or the same thing when x go to a from the left, this thing is called left hand derivative. On the other hand, if you say h goes to zero from the right and x go to a from the right, this thing is called right hand derivative. And if your left hand derivative exists and your right hand derivative exists, they are both uh, equal to each other as well. That is number one. And number two, you also know that f prime at a minus equal to f prime at a plus. So if you have this two condition, you can conclude that f prime a exists. Right. This is the same thing when you learn limit, right? So when you learn limit, the left hand limit exists and the right hand limit exists, and then they are equal to each other. That means limit exists. So the same thing if your left hand derivative exists and then your right hand derivative exists. So you can conclude that your derivative at the point x equal to a exists. Well, what keep in mind that not every case is that you're gonna use the left hand and right hand limit. So the key point is we will have to use this if we face a piecewise function. The idea is if you face the fx equal to the piecewise function, that's something x less than or equal to one, something x greater than one. Well, for this case, you have to go back to the definition of limit and use the left hand and right hand limit, right? Uh, left hand and right hand derivatives. Because, well, on the left hand, you use one function. On the right hand, you use another function. So this is the sensitive case that you have to come back and use the definition. Well, at any other point, let's say I want to figure out the derivative at x equal to 2. Well, I don't have to be worried about the left hand and right hand limit because I will use the same function to compute anyway. Does it make sense? So we talk about the definition of derivative because we're going to use this thing to help us to compute the derivative in the case that we, we need more accuracy because we need, we use the different functions on both sides. So that means, well, you have to be careful and come back and use definition of derivatives. We're gonna look at examples today and you will, you will see some example that represent what I just said on this right. So let's move to the first example. Okay, this one, yeah, this one, it's coming. So example 31, so I let f, be a function defined by 3x squared plus 1, where x less than or equal to 1, and fx equal to 5 minus x cubed, where x greater than 1. So find the derivative of f at x equal to 1 if it exists. If not, explain why. So you can see that what we want is we want to find the derivative of f at x equal to 1. But the left hand side of one, you're gonna use the function that I highlight in green. And the right hand of x equal to one, we're gonna use a function that I highlight in light blue. So let's compute 
left hand limit left hand oh sorry not limit left hand derivative so this thing going to be uh, f prime of a minus right but uh, my a is one now so this is my notation and that means I want to compute limit of uh, fx minus f1 over x minus 1, where x goes 1 from the left. This is a definition of derivatives, right? Keep in mind, well, I will write it here. So if you cannot remember, the definition of derivative at the point a, this is limit of f, fx plus fa or minus fa. <laughs> over x minus a, x approach a, all right? So that is the definition of f prime. And then now we can uh, evaluate this thing. So fx is going to be, because x go to one from the left. So I am going to have three x squared plus one and then minus f one which you can compute it, right? Because one is here. So that means uh, you're gonna plug in number one there and then you get number four. Uh, and then over X minus one. All right, and then you can see that something gonna cancel now. So you have three X squared minus three over X minus one. And that means if you pull out number three, so you have three times X squared minus one, right? And then once you see x squared minus one, you was like, oh, I want to factor so bad, right? This is x minus one and x plus one, right? Then over x minus one, and then this cancel. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And then at the end, you're gonna have uh, six, right? Because you plug in number one there. So you're gonna get three times two, which is six. And then let's hope that the right hand limit gonna give us the same number. Oh, let's... Um, what about the minus four? Say it again. What about the minus four? Three x squared plus one minus four. Oh, I mean, I go too fast, but I say one minus four is minus three. So yeah, so I will simplify it for you. So three x squared plus one minus four, right? This one minus four is minus three. Is that clear? And then I just pull on number oh, three okay. after. Thank you. All right. All right. And right hand derivative is well if i go too fast let, let me know because sometimes i just i think too fast and then well if i skip some steps so let me know so i can slow down so f prime one plus so now i am going to well you can see that the difference is we are going to use different functions so we're going to use five minus x cube well sorry too fast so i'm going to do fx minus f1 over x minus one. Again, the difference is we are going to use different function here. So we're gonna have five minus x cubed minus four, right? Over x minus one. And then, so on the numerator, I have one minus x cubed. And then on the numerator, I have x minus one. So again, you need to do the cubic factoring so I am going to have one minus x times one plus x plus x squared over x minus one. So if you feel like, hey, Ajahn, I don't know how to do the cubic factoring. I cannot guarantee that, well, you're gonna see or don't see the cubic factoring on the exam or not, but well, let's, let's try to make sure that you can do it because it is simple like that. So Usually we ask you to do a cube minus b cube, and then you can factor a minus b out from that uh, term. So after that, I cancel one minus x and x minus one, so I have negative one, right? Because just switch the sign. And then after that, I plug in number one there, so I get negative, negative, just come from negative one, and then one plus one plus one. Here we go, negative three. And then you can see, bam, ah, they are not equal to each other. So that means f prime one does not exist. Well, if you wanna 
put the reason because f prime one minus is not equal to f prime one plus. So you can see that at the point that you have a break on the function, so you have to be careful when you use definition. All right, so let's do more example. All right, before more example, so let's look at the formula here. So I think that 80 or 90% of you have seen this thing before. We're gonna do a review from your high school. So at least if you passed a little bit of calculus before, so you have seen the formula of derivative. So the idea is if every time we're gonna use limit all the time, it's gonna be time consuming as I told you. So we're gonna build up our formula so we can compute the derivative easily. You can prove this thing, but I'm not going to prove it for you because you know you can just look at the proof on any book. But we don't have time to discuss the proof here, but we're gonna just state the rules and then you can memorize and use it. So the first one is the basic. If you differentiate uh, constant, so you get zero. If you differentiate x, you get one. That is the basic. So if you differentiate and then you have the constant time the function, let's say c time fx, well, you can pull out c. Simple like that. And then power rule, if you differentiate x to the r, what happened? So some of you have memorized uh, you're gonna have r x to the r minus one, right? Because you just that is a formula for the power rule, and then sum and difference. So if you see different uh, of f x plus r minus g x here, this is equal to the thing that you can compute derivative first, and then add or minus after add or subtract after. Same thing, you can do that. Well, the two things that you have to keep in mind is product rule and quotient rule. So d by dx of fx times gx, this is the product rule. So it's gonna be fx times d by dx gx plus uh, gx d by dx fx, right? And then after that, the quotient rule, the last one, well, when you use the quotient rule, just make sure that your gx is not equal to zero. Well, you need more condition, but well, you once you assume that gx is not equal to zero, so you can use the quotient rule, which is going to be the uh, gx uh, d by dx fx minus fx d by dx gx over gx square. So this is the formula that you can prove by just using the you know simple method and then you need to memorize the formula here. So some of you have technique to memorize that so I cannot remember. Well like for example the quotient rule when I, when I taught the student in America when I was uh, a teaching assistant there. So I heard that student gonna say, hey, the quotient rule is low d high minus high d low over low square. Well, well, if you keep repeating that thing, so eventually you're gonna memorize it. Like differentiate uh, quotient rule f over g, this is low d high minus high d low over low square or something like that. So you can look up online the technique to memorize the formula, but at the end, this is all that you have to memorize it. Well, but it is not that hard because once you keep doing it, well, you're gonna absorb the formula automatically. So let's look at example 32 here. So we're gonna use the quotient rule here. So I have fx equal to this function. You can see that when I use the quotient rule, so this is the simple method that you should use. So you're gonna do, uh, my x to the fourth power minus five x, this is the top function. 
and then x squared plus three, this is the bottom function, and then you use low d high minus high d low, and then at the end you get this answer. Does it make sense? I'm not going to show, uh, you know, read step by step for you, but once you see the solution here, you should be able to follow it easily. I don't get it. You don't get it? So I don't uh, for the second line to the third line. Where does the D over the X go? Okay, let's uh, is the is the uh, is the power rule, right? Okay, one second. Well I will I will show you step by step then if you feel like this is too fast. So thank you. Uh, let's let's start by looking at this function. So I am going to let my F to be the green one. I am going to let uh, the light blue one to be my blue one. And then when I, do, when I do the differentiation, so I'm gonna have G, right? Which is this G and then differentiate F and then minus F differentiate G. Right, and then over G square. Well, you keep in mind that the thing that you already pull out from the differential operator, so you don't have to touch it again. So here, my X square plus three, this is out of differential operator already, so I don't have to touch it, this is done. This term is done because it's it's out of d by dx, and this thing is done because it's out of d by dx. So what you need to compute is just something inside the differential operator here. Well, when you differentiate x to the fourth power, so you're gonna get four x cubed. This is because by the power rule. And then when you differentiate five x, you're gonna get five because this is by the constant rule, right? Yeah, you pull out five and you have d by dx of x, which is one. And then here, x squared plus three, you differentiate x squared, you get two x, you differentiate three, you get zero. And then that leaves you two x. And then, well, for the exam, you can stop here. If you are lazy to simplify, I give you full credit anyway. If you stop there, you don't need to simplify more. And then, but if you want to simplify, you can simplify and you're gonna get this answer. Does it make sense? So this is how we use the uh, formula to compute the derivatives. Wait, Ajahn, so once you get this derivative, derivative equation, you use the limit law, something or? Nothing about limit law. So here we just, we don't use limit because we already have the formula. So we're gonna use the formula. Okay. Okay. So here we're gonna use the formula because we have the formula already. So I will I will show you some example that you have to use a formula mixed with the definition in a minute. So I mean in in 10 to 20 minutes, you're gonna see the example that you have a question that you have to use both formula and also the definition of derivatives. So let's move on to another example and then you will see some more interesting examples. So let's look at example 33. So I want you to compute dy by dx. So this is so simple. So I'm gonna go uh, a little bit fast on the example. So I have y equal to, well, negative three over x to the eighth power. So here you can simplify it to three, negative three time x to the negative eight. The reason why I simplify to this because usually students are comfortable with x to the n. And then you know that if you differentiate this, so you're gonna get n x to the n minus one. Usually you are comfortable with this form. So it is recommended that when you see three over x to the eight power, you swap it to x to the negative eight first. So it is easy to differentiate. And then the same thing with two times square root x, this is two times x to the one half. 
once you get to this form, so now you can differentiate easily. So my notation is going to be y prime or dy by dx, the same thing. This is just the notation. So I am going to have negative three and then don't touch negative three because it's already done. And then you have x to the negative eight. So this is negative eight and then x to the negative eight minus one. I go slow here because some of you don't know how to differentiate, but if you are faster than me, very good. So here I have two times one half and then x to the one half minus one, right? And then this is 24 x to the negative nine and then plus one time x to the negative one half. If you want to leave your answer here, fine, you could. But if you are smarter than me, so you can say this is 24 over x to the nine power and then plus one over square root x, this is fine too, both way. I would suggest that on the exam, if you stop on the red box here, you should move on to another question. Don't waste your time to simplify because that is not our point for calculus. We just wanna test you how to differentiate. We don't test you how to simplify. So if you get to this point, you can stop that, done, you're good. Well, if you simplify and you get the wrong answer, you lose your point. So stop there, you're done. All right, so let's look at another example here, the second question. So I have y equal to x minus one times x to the fifth power plus two x, everything square. So the number two, that is square. So here, because we have not done chain rule, so some of you are gonna use the chain rule, which is easy, but well, we're not going to use the chain rule. We are going to use the, uh, just the expand and product rule because we have not uh, covered the chain rule. So if you wanna expand that thing, so you expand x to the fifth power plus two x. So you're gonna get x to the 10 power and then plus uh, four. Well, I'm going slow here. So two times x to the fifth power and then two x and then plus four x squared. So the reason why I do this because I don't have chain rule yet, but for next class, we're gonna learn chain rule. And once we learn chain rule, this question is gonna be easy. But if you don't have chain rule, so you have to expand that square. And then you have x minus one and then x to the 10 power and then plus four x to the six, and then plus four x square. And then some of you are gonna multiply again, you can or you can now use the product rule. So I'm gonna use the product rule. So dy by dx here. So I'm gonna uh, leave my front function and then I differentiate the back function here. And then after that, I leave my second function and then I differentiate the first function here. And then after that, I have x minus one. Again, you can see that x minus one and this function, the one, the one that I highlight in green, we don't have the differential operator over them. So don't touch it, just leave it there. And then here you're gonna have 10 x to the nine power and then plus 24 x to the fifth power and then plus eight x. Then plus here I have x to the 10 power plus four x to the six plus four x square. And then this is one because x minus one, you differentiate, you get one. And then you leave the answer here, you're done. Does it make sense? So I know that more than the half of the class now think that this is too easy. That is good because we have not covered the hard part yet. This is the easy part. So everyone should be able to do this easily and quick. And don't leave the room yet because, well, the example is gonna get harder and harder and harder. Well, there will be some questions that you have not seen in your high school and it's gonna take some serious concept. All right, so we're gonna just take more step and look at example 2034. This is still easy, but we're gonna just keep going and then getting to, this is still easy question. We're gonna start from the easy one, go to the medium one and the hard one. All right, so 
let's look at 34. This should be done in one or two lines. This is super easy. So I have fx equal to square root x times gx. And then I also have the condition that g4 equal to 8 and g prime 4 equal to 7. Well, I want you to find f prime 4. Some of you are going to have a hard time when you see the notations because you get confused when, when we give you some condition in notation like that. So take the step back and just go slow. So this is what I'm going to do. So I have f prime at 4, right? I want f prime at 4 so I can, I can just think of f prime x first. Well, if I want to compute f prime x, that means I want to compute derivative of f, right? And that means I want to compute derivative of square root x times gx. Well, this is my f, this is my g. And if you want to use product rule, it's going to be f dg, right? And g dx, right? And then after that, you're going to uh, plug in number four, right? Oh, before you plug in number four, you can just say that d by d by the x of g, this is g prime x. And then g prime x, or g x is g x, and then differentiate x squared, so you get what? So I'm gonna leave it here, d by the x of square root x. Because I did this so many times, so I'm gonna say one over two over square root x, because, well, you know, in my life, I have done this thing more than a thousand times. So if I wanna differentiate square root x, I just get one over two square root x right away because I memorize it. But for those of you who are still a beginner, so you can start from uh, d by dx. This is x to the one half, and then that will be one half x to the negative one half, and that is one half times one over square root x, and this is the same thing. But because we are going to use square root x here all the time, so I am going to say, hey, difference is square root x. And then I am going to say, hey, this is one over two square root x. Well, because that is faster for me because I get the answer immediately because I did it so many times. So, well, I mean, the part is if I did to go too fast, so you have to stop me. And then after that, f prime four, this is going to be uh, square root four. So now I evaluate everything at four. So this is g prime four, and then g four, and then one over two square root four, right? And square root four is two, g prime four is seven. Well, you have it. And then g of four is eight. And then that is one over two times two, which is 14 plus, Two, which is 16. All right. Well, this is still easy question. All right, any question you type in the chat, please. So we have about 20 minutes left, 25 minutes left before I let you go. So any question you type in the chat, please. All right, no questions. So too easy, right? All right, so we're gonna look at two examples. Two more examples at least. So this is the one that you're gonna use the mixed thing between the derivative, the formula of derivative and the uh, definition. Good one, this is the medium one. Well, because when we ask you to do this, some of you are gonna use the formula and then the solution is not complete because you know, if you face a function like this, you need to be careful at x equal to two because at x equal to two, you are not allowed to use the formula. So you have to use the definition because on the left hand side, you use one function. The right hand side, you use another function. So it is not guaranteed that at x equal to two, it's gonna work by the formula. Well, you have no theorem about it. So you have to use the definition. So, it's just 3.58 p.m. now, so everyone type in the chat, check in, so I know that you are here today. So in case that, well, in case that 
you know, I want to check the attendance at some point so I can, I know that you attend the class, you participate. So, well, if you need my help, I will help you. All right, next, uh, example 35. So, well, I am going to start by looking at the case that you, uh, the, ca the case that X is not equal to two. So first, let's consider when X greater than two. What happened when X greater than two? When X greater than two, so the left hand and the right hand, we're gonna use the same function. So that's mean F prime X, this is equal to six uh, X minus seven, right? Well, this is by the formula. Simple. And then, when x less than two, what happened? So we're gonna use the formula, but because this is x over x minus three, so we're gonna use the quotient rule. That means x minus three d by dx of x plus x times d by dx of x minus three over x minus three square. All right, and then after that, well, just simplify it. So I have x minus three plus, what? Right, because this thing is one. So this thing, this is one, right? And this thing that is one too. So that means this is x, oops, sorry, my formula is wrong. This is uh, v du minus u dv over v squared, okay. And then this should be minus, and then minus x and then over x minus three square. And you get negative three over x minus three square. So the point is at the point that you don't have the conflict between the left hand function and the right hand function, you can use the formula. So you can see that when x greater than two and when x less than two, I have no worry about the function. So I can use the formula, but when x equal to two, this is the one that you have to be careful. So we're gonna come back and use the definition. All right, let's look at this problem. So I am going to compute the left hand derivative. So which is going to be my limit, fx minus f2 over x minus two, where x go to two to the left, this is the definition of left hand limit. And then after that, well, because on the left hand side of two, I need to use this function, x over x minus three. And then that is F2. Well, let me compute F2 first. So F2 gonna be two over two minus three, which is negative two. So that's mean I have negative two here. Well, you hope for sure that something gonna cancel, right? And then at the end, you should get some nice function. So you're gonna have, well, a little bit tough because you have to find the common denominator, which is x minus three. And then that is x plus two times x minus three. And then over x minus two. All right, and then that is limit x go to two to, from the left. On the top, you have x plus two x minus six, right? Which is three x minus six, which is three times x minus two. And then on the denominator, you have x minus three and x minus two. All right, and then now you cancel. Sure. And then add again, you get three over two minus three, which is negative three. Right. And then uh, the right hand derivative. So this is limit x go to two from the right. And then fx minus f2 over x minus two. This time, the difference is you are going to use the right hand function, so which is going to be uh, 3x squared minus 7x, right? 
minus minus two over x minus two, right? And then after that, you simplify it. So on the numerator, you have three x squared minus seven x plus two. So you can factoring. Well, I pull out x minus two, and then I have three x minus one left. So I did it too fast because well, I well, but I I believe that everyone can factor this thing. So you can cancel x minus two, and then you get five. For because you get the left hand derivative equal to negative three, the right hand derivative equal to five. So that means f prime two does not exist. Here we go. So this is our. Uh, I will answer some question on the chat pretty soon. But well, let me say that here I my summary is f prime two does not exist. Well, our friends ask that can we use the power rule when calculating one-sided derivative? The answer is no. No, because, well, I mean, technically, some cases you can use it, but because we want you to use a definition, because we just want you to go back to the root and use a definition. So let's use a definition. Well. Actually, you can define your left hand and right hand derivative to be uh, and use the the formula. But the formula that we develop, we just develop based on the theory that we compute the two sided limits. Oh, sorry, uh, two sided derivatives. Well, I mean, to sum up, when you compute one sided derivative, you have to use definition. Well, you are not allowed to use the formula because we assume that the formula cannot be used for one-sided limit. No, well, that is what we assume. So I have f prime two does not exist here, and then my conclusion is here. So my f prime x this is going to be uh, six x minus seven if x greater than two right and this is going to be negative three over x minus three square if x less than two at x equal one second is it is it freezing you hear me everyone hear me I think something is facing. Hello. Oh, you hear me? But I think it's, you know, the screen is facing. <laughs> well, one second, I mean, let me fix my screen. This will stop. Juan, you hear me, right? Can you write something? Uh, I mean, I have some internet problem. I think that's why the screen is facing. Just give me a minute. So I am going to fix it now. Share screen. One second, everyone. One second, one second. I am going to redo this thing five five nine four nine four four all right i'll give you one or two minute break well we have one more example i think and then we should be good for today one second people I'll leave. All right. All right. Come back now. Good. Well, I think my iPad is freezing. So that's why you don't see anything. So let's come back to example 35. After I compute 
uh, the left hand and right hand derivative at two. So my conclusion for the derivative at two is it does not exist. So that means my f prime x is going to be this answer. So six x minus seven when x greater than two and negative three over x minus three square when if x less than two. And you know what? I think more than half of you will get into my trap if this is the exam. Because some of you are gonna just use the formula and then you forgot to show that the derivative at two does not exist. So keep in mind that when you see the piecewise function, you have to use the definition to compute the derivative at the break point all right so this is regular formula my tongue what is my tongue huh? like you don't need to use the yeah yeah i mean if it is f. not if it is not a piece y function this is the question so it is not a piece y function you can use formula fine simple like that all right so Example 36, one more, and then I think this should be our last example, I think, by looking at the time. Yeah, could be the last example. Yeah, okay. So let's do one more. This is also the O exams. So let's look at the medium one, one more time, and then, well, we can stop for today. All right, example 36. So again, when you see the function like this and the question asks you to find the derivative of f. So for sure that between zero and two, I can use a formula. Greater than two, I can use a formula, but x equal to two here. Well, on the left-hand side, I use one function. On the right-hand side, I use one, fu one function. So at x equal to two, this is the sensitive one. So you have to use the definition. So again, when you do the problem, so let's start by when x greater than two, let's do the easy one first. So my f prime x gonna be two x min, uh, minus five. Easy because, uh, well, the function has no break on the domain x greater than two. All right, so when x is between zero and two, so what happened? So f prime x, so you have to differentiate uh, four over x minus one, right? Which is uh, four times differentiate x to the negative one and then minus zero, right? Which is uh, four negative one x to the negative two, which is negative four over x squared. All right, that's easy. And then the last one, when x equal to two, all right, this is the challenge one. So I need to compute the derivative from the left. Uh, what is the derivative from the left? So that means limit x go to two to the, from the left, and then fx minus f2. So you can see that every time I show my work, I am trying not to skip the step because if I make a mistake, so I can go back and fix it easily. And it is going to be good for you and graders as well because if the graders see, well, if the graders see the mistake, so they can follow that, hey, you make a mistake here. And then, you know, once you lose your part, you're gonna lose just a little bit because they know that you can do everything, you just miscalculate it. Uh, here I replace my fx to be this function, right? And then my f2 is one because I have f2 equal to one, all right? And then now I need to calculate this thing. So I am going to have uh, x minus two here. I have four minus two x over x here because I, uh, some negative one and negative one to be negative two and then I make the denominator to be x. And then after that, tick tock, tick tock, I need to cancel, right? It seems like you can factor x minus two 
So I am going to pull out to, uh, let's say, pull out negative two. So I have x minus two, right? Because I pull out negative two from four minus two x, and then I have x times x minus two here. Cancel. All right, negative two over two, negative one. Sounds good. And then f prime two from the right. So you have limit x go to two from the right. F x minus f two over x minus two. And that is limit x go to two from the right. And then x squared plus, no, not plus, minus five x plus seven minus one over x minus two. All right, something gonna cancel, not cancel. So we have x squared minus five x plus six here, right? And then I can factoring, right, to be x minus two and x minus three. Well, this is also negative one, right? Because you're gonna cancel x minus two and then plug into you get negative one. So for this question, you are lucky enough that your f prime to x is and equal to negative one. Does it make sense? And then your conclusion gonna be, this is your conclusion in the box. So your conclusion gonna be f prime x, this is going to be, uh, negative four over x square, where x between zero and two, right? And then equal to negative one, where x equal to two, and then x greater than two, that means you get uh, two x minus five. Well, actually you can uh, group the case that x equal to two to either one, because if you plug in x equal to two, uh, into the function, so you get the same value as well. So by this, I mean, if someone say that, Ajahn, I wanna answer f prime x equal to negative four over x square and two x minus five, where zero less than, x less than two, and here x is greater than or equal to two. Can I do that? Yes, the answer you can, but before you do the summary here, you need to show your work first that the derivative of f at two exists and equal to negative one. That makes sense. So this is the one that I think uh, you should keep in mind that, well, you can use the definition when it's come back to, you know, uh, I mean, when you face the sensitive cases. All right, any questions? Any questions for 15 now? Actually, we have 15 minutes left, but well, let me see if we should continue or not. So let me, let me talk about differentiability a little bit, and then we're gonna come back for example on Wednesday. So I want to show you this picture that uh, for differentiability. So this thing, in terms of the real world. Differentiability means smoothness. You know that if the function f is differentiable at x equal to, at x equal to a, that means the graph of f has a tangent line at x equal to a. Well, if f is defined, at x equal to a, but f is not differentiable. That means the tangent line cannot be completely defined. And this is, this is the example of the case that we fail to have the differentiable condition. So let's look at case number one here. You can see the case number one that the function is smooth, but at some point when you hit a here, you're gonna see that the function just chop on this point. This is the case that most of the time people uh, do not like to use the absolute value function because the absolute value function 
if you draw the graph, it's gonna be the graph of y equal to absolute x. And then at the x, at x equal to zero, the function is so sharp here. So that means, hey, when the function is sharp, the function is not differentiable. Well, that means you lose some property. So this is why people love to use x squared compared to absolute value of x. Well, for those of you who are engineer and when you do the quality controls, sometimes when you use a formula, you're gonna see that people love to use x squared compared to square root x. Oh, sorry, use x squared compared to absolute x because x squared has a smooth property, but absolute x, the function is not smooth and it's gonna be, it's gonna fail to have differentiable property. That is why, that is one reason that we prefer x square compared to absolute x. Well, another case is this and this. So I think some of you are ready to leave. So we should stop here. So I'm not going to explain something more for today. All right, so thank you everyone. Uh, let me look at the chat. Anyone have any question? No? All right, so thank you and then See you again on Wednesday. All right, thank you. You can say something. All right, it's fine. Thank you, thank you. Excuse me, Ajahn. Don't talk. Go for it. Who, who said that? Bye. Um, Ajahn. I have a question. Uh, oh, go for it. Um, I want to find practice where I can get more practice. Email me, email me monchai.k at jula.ac.th. I'm gonna find some practice problem for you. Thank you. Well, email me and state your request, what you want, and then so I will address it for you. Monchai, wait, how do I spell it? Well, see in the chat one second. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. All right, so let's stop here and see you on, Monday, on Wednesday, 3 p.m. Everyone, all right. Class dismissed.